Uh, welcome to a discussion of not one but two Wild Bow works. Um, you get two for the price of one with timestamps. So if you're not interested in pale or packed, if you only like one of them, you can check out the timestamp. Um, yeah, the other verse power hour. I think that's how people re refer to these two. Uh, we could yeah, we could call this the other podcast. Yeah. Oh fuck. <laughs> um, uh, I decided to do them both together because I've been back on reading both of them. Now, they're the I, same story, am I right, everybody? I, no, they're very different. <laughs> <laughs> so different. I know, um, right? So, pa Pao is currently on its seventh arc, I believe. However, uh, you guys might notice on our channel we did one talk about Pao. And then many months went by, and here's our second talk about Pale. And it's like, oh, how much Pale did y'all read in that time? Well, B Bradley, where are you in Pale? Uh, I think I'm on arc five out of seven. Uh, I, I kind of have, I'll kind of have like one day each week where I'll read like maybe two or three chapters. So uh, inevitably, I get I get a little bit behind each week, and then it kind of adds up. It's much worse for me because I'm I'm still in arc two, and we're gonna discuss why. I'm still in our arc too. Um, just in general, since the pandemic hit, you think I'd have more time to like li I audiobook these, um, as people probably know, and you think I'd probably have more time, but I haven't really found the right activity to pair with audiobooking uh, Wild Bow Works. Like before, I would drive, and near the end of a work day, I throw it on, like in the last thirty minutes, and then just roll that into my drive home. Um, working from home, I haven't really found the bright time. But recently, Thanksgiving happened, so that's when I wrapped up a lot of these arcs. So yeah, like uh, Doof Media has various podcasts just discussing Wild Bow books, and uh, like I hadn't actually listened to all that much of the one they did for Pale because you know I <laughs> I had been either working from home slash jobless for a significant portion of this year. Yeah. And then, uh, like, now that I'm actually driving to an office now, I listen to their podcast, which is fantastic. And uh, Pale Reflections, like, right? Yeah. Pale Reflections. I was just yeah. listening to it to refresh or to um, get some further understanding on 2.9, because that was pretty confusing. So a problem is... Especially with the first half of Arc 2 of Pale. It's been a very long time since I covered oh, it. Oh, and going into this talk, uh, like, are, do we give listeners heads up if, like, this is a full spoiler talk of what we've read? Or is it, like, because, like, I think the vibe I got is, like, obviously some people might not be starting Pale since they yeah. want to wait till it's done. And I think Pact is, like, the least read Wild Bow book, so... I thought my spoiler policy would be like, you know, if I want to talk about something that's like a short beat, then I could talk about it, but not like overall details. But I don't know. What Man, do with so that's that's uh, we should have discussed this before because with Pack, right. like there's there's some very specific things in Pack that I really that so would probably bring up. Uh, I did write down a bunch of highlights for this arc, but those would all be spoiler. -y. You know what? I think we can say. This will be full spoilers, but keep in mind that, like, it's full spoilers for the first, like, few arcs of each of the stories, so. Yeah, because, um, I, th I, I think we should open with, like, a general of what I thought of this portion of the story. So what we're covering with Pale yeah. right now is Arc 2, and this might be a controversial take, but Arc 2 was one of the hardest arcs for me to get through in any Wild Bow work that I've read so far. And that includes, like, some of the slow parts of Worm that I would complain about back in the days. Um, I've had yeah, some discussions and, with Bradley about this as well. Yeah, and it, it, it's really strange because, you know, when I was first reading Pact, I was like, oh, my God, Willard, like, this, you would love this. Uh, and, like, for example, Worm is something that I kind of recommend to everybody. Uh, Pale, at least on the dudes on this podcast, uh, I enjoy it, but I don't know if I might hard recommend Pale to any of the other three. Yeah. Um, I, I think I, I think uh, all of us like would like Pact. I spoiler alert: I'm really loving Pact right now. I don't know how you can be a human being and not 
love Pat. It's so good. Apparently it happens. It's the least Apparently popular it one. Happens. Um I don't know how that can be. It must be some sort of other uh magic. But <laughs> other, get it? <laughs> so a, a big portion of arc two um is kind of focusing on expanding the initial dynamics that they set up in arc one especially the home dynamics i felt like um we got a lot of beats with that and a little bit of the group dynamic especially when um lucy is getting on avery's case about some of her decisions in this portion of the story um i i think that's accurate to say that those those were the focuses and i feel like it was just a really slow and kind of boring arc because of that. Now, there were, uh, of course, some portions that I did like that we can get into. But how do you feel about, like, because, Bradley, you'll have to remember this portion of the story while admitting, like, three other arcs you've read. So that might be a little difficult. But Yeah, and uh, there is, like, a lot of setup in this arc. But uh, it's kind of strange because... One way I described Pale is, you know, I, I've read like five or six arcs of Ward, and the way I kind of describe Pale right now is Pale is to Pact what Ward is to Worm, where Pact and Worm have a lot more of just like balls to the wall. There's like fighting, there's action, horrible I, shits happening. I'd say there's a focus on action and plot. Because uh, yeah. not a lot of plot happened, I feel like, as well. Yeah, P Pale and Ward, they... Oh, uh, no, you know how I saw someone describe it? It's like, Ward is the action movie, and Ward is like a... Kind of like a hike through a nature trail, which, mm -hmm. if you like hikes through nature trails, <laughs> You're that's fucking this. enjoable. You're going to love this trail. It's, so, it's kind of weird because I would always complain about too much action in Worm, but I think Pale, it's kind of like a different... But even like when yeah. Pale, comparing Pale to Pack, there's too little action in Pale. Yeah, yeah. so it's kind of like in Worm and Pack, you, you will have like big, climactic, high-stakes battles, and those are like where your kind of moments of triumph and climax are. In Pale, there are some really fucking cool chapters, like the Hungry Fire chapter. Yeah. Uh, but in Pale, I think the moments of triumph, rather than being in fights, are more moments when these, you know, 13-year-old girls either realize something about themselves or stand up for themselves. And if that's not the kind of story uh, you want to sign up for, then, you know... That's understandable. Th though I will say, there are some crazy fucking fights that, that happen as it goes on. And Pale probably has my favorite interludes of any of the Volvo books. But the, uh, the like, meat of the arcs is, like, more low energy than you'll probably find. In Interesting. That, that's... Because, like, the Gabe interlude was incredible. Like, it, oh, that's yes. kind of, like, that That might be part of why Arc 2 wasn't hitting as as hard. Cause, like, How do you follow that up? And and apparently not very well by my estimation, because you set the highest high, and then you coasted. I will say, and getting into some of the highlights of this arc, I'm not even going to hit every highlight I wrote, because I feel like we just did a pretty good summation of our thoughts on this arc. Um, yeah. But, like, I thought this arc started pretty good because, like, the current antagonist is the Hungry Kyre and we're helping them because the girls are trying to help Reagan, who they met a little earlier, right? So, but, yeah. but we kind of uh, lose our way, I think. We lose focus. Maybe that's something I could form as a critique. Um, it feels a little unfocused at times because, sure, the Hungry Kyre is the current antagonist, but let's not forget that the premise of the story is the Karn Mind Beast mystery which um yeah and that's something uh i know that's like a thing i saw you say and then i remember also around arc two and three just in discussion threads uh i think that thought was also echoed like hey remember when this was a murder mystery <laughs> and to be fair where i'm at like tremendous progress has been made in that mystery but that's good like you know whenever it feels like there was a break in the mystery for an arc or two you know it's like hey come on yeah Cause like so in the in the beginning of this arc, like we're still like we're coming high off of the hungry choir, 
maybe they're really mm-hmm. involved in the mystery um there's a lot of characters to keep track of which can be problematic but like i like the portion where the girls are researching the ritual online and avery i feel like she almost gets tricked into joining it as i recall it's been a while um right like she's she's messing on the website and the website is kind of like being manipulated yeah i thought that was pretty cool um in this portion we also have like uh we have a little portion where like we meet the fairies um they're kind of like teaching the girls about glamour i feel like avery is like the glamour specialist of the group if you want to call it that because there was a portion of the story dedicated to her practicing glamour and all that i think you could call it that yeah uh, I do like this beat where the fairy call all the girls other in their own ways, which is potentially a theme to expand upon yeah. in the upcoming arcs. Um, there was the controversial non-consensual kiss when Avery yeah. was turned. This, this was like a really big controversy on the subreddit, apparently. I, I, re- um... I remember this being spicy. This was around the time where I, like, I fell off the the kind of pale, like keeping up you know. Really. It's it's not the fact that there was a lesbian kiss. I think it's people like how many times is while Bo gonna write a quote unquote predatory lesbian? Yeah, and, is what they said. And, and I mean, and the answer is more than you think, <laughs> apparently. Yeah, um, and you know, for example, the other predatory lesbian would obviously be Panacea. Yeah, and that felt more predatory than this. This to me felt like. She is a, she's basically a child who just probably didn't think about how inconsiderate doing that might be. Yeah, like I didn't you think know? it was too bad, but I guess if you if if Pale was like his first story, right? If this was yeah. Jesse McRae's first story, that I think I don't think people would have been as worried about yeah. it because like we come here for the flawed main characters and all that, right? Yeah. Um. But I think with the history, and we don't know what happens in Ward. Apparently, like it, it's prevalent there as well. So <clears throat> I could see people who are more versed in the Wild Bill universe being more complaining or like being more apprehensive towards this plot point. Yeah. Um, it did did uh, advance the group dynamic because uh, when Lucy finds out, um, she gets really mad at them, and it really becomes clear that. Lucy's the only one who kind of has the right mentality when going about this. I feel like Avery's too nonchalant. And so is um, Verona. But Verona also has like her weird alternative motives of like, being an other would be kind of cool. And fuck everything else. Yeah, so. it's like... Like, Lucy got awakened into this mystery, like... And she feels a sense of duty about it. I feel like <coughs> Verona was just like i mean i'll get awakened but it's more because i want to do magic shit and yeah. you know sure there's also a mystery out there you know and what was avery's motivation again uh you know avery i a big part of it is you know she feels out of place a lot yeah. of the time yeah and so getting into this with i think her two friends will help build a sense of camaraderie and also uh, I think specifically in her awakening, she's like, you know, I want to see amazing things. I want to do amazing things. And this is like the one way to do it. Yeah. But. And it's like, I don't know if they're doing anything amazing yet. So I hope they can do that. It's, it's kind that's kind of like something that happened recently with Pact, uh, where I am, where like Blake is really trying to, um, do something good with what he considers to be his remaining time left on this planet because like yeah <laughs> he's very mortalistic about it um or fatalistic rather uh yeah. I, I did find it interesting that it took this long to implement familiars and domains um and implements like, yeah it, it took and, a uh, while for people, that to come up because uh, i thought about that and other people talk about it too and i think the consensus is like the reason it's brought up so early in pact is because it was in uh, it was in Blake's grandma's guide on how to not die in <laughs> his first six hours of living, and then uh, I think specifically for Pale, and uh, the others have like explicitly said this in the story, at least where I'm at, where like they don't want 
the girls to be strong or even like real practitioners. They're supposed to be figureheads. That's right. Yeah, they've had some conversations. Um, I don't know if they've explicitly said it yet, but based on the conversations they have that I'm remembering, that does add up. Um, it like I'll get to it in a little bit, but they're okay. So, an- so one problem I'm having with Pale. And this is completely personal. And you could be like, just throw my, actually throw my opinions away because of this problem, honestly. Oh, shit. Like, if, if you don't agree with my opinions, just disregard them. They're not that strong anyways at the end of the day. Because I'm audiobooking it. And, and this is a problem I have with Pale more than Warm and Pact. With Pact, everything's like actually super crystal clear, even with audiobooking. But with Pale, I feel like sometimes I will zone out or miss two to three lines of dialogue or exposition and then just be half lost for the entire chapter. And this happened, this one portion where I believe they enter someone's dream with Alpina. Was it Verona's dad's dream? I think. Uh, they were going to do Verona's dad, but Verona chickened out for probably good reason. Cause it's kind of horrifying, they but did... then they went to someone else. Okay. Yeah. And in this dream, they fight a practitioner, I think. Who what that wasn't Nicolette, was it? Uh so they fought an other that was an like other. Okay. Really by Nicolette. Yeah. Wait, but it was involved with Nicolette? It was, yeah. Alright, okay, interesting. Because yeah, where I'm at in the story, they're like fighting for that third victory, which is a recurring plot um structure that I think Wildbo goes to. Which is really cool. Um it it, it might be samey in a way, but also like it's it's this bound rule in this world where that third victory counts the most. And I, it's just interesting to write around that. And I don't know. It always It's an easy way to set up tension as well. So I yeah. think that's pretty cool. But uh, to kind of go along with what you were saying, like I do really like Pale. But I will agree that uh, I'm not audiobooking it. I'm reading it like you know text-wise. And mm-hmm. I do kind of agree with the notion that if I, if I don't – have a good reading comprehension of one particular line, I could be really lost for the rest of the chapter. So I find myself, like, maybe rereading a sentence more often than I would in Pact. Yeah, because, okay, so in Worm, a big, the like, one of the main things I had with Worm as a negative was, like, the action was long. Like, there was a lot of fighting, and the fighting, I thought, was too long each time. Not Not, like, every time, but in general, right? So I might get lost in the middle of the fight of like, wait, where are we now? Because um, I missed like one action that Taylor did. Uh, but there's signposts that Wild Bill uses so you can get back into it. Like, okay, okay, that's where we're at. I feel like the signposting in Pale is a little bit further spread apart. Also, it's more abstracted nature, right? So it's like, not only might you get lost from stuff you should have be understanding, but also some of the stuff is just in general hard to understand. Like, um, I thought the ribbon trial near the end was just, like, even after I went back and read, I was like, okay, this is just, like, pretty gnarly and, and abstract to begin with. Um, and the whole snowdrop thing. Uh, like, if you don't pick up on that, like, you could completely miss out a thing that happens in Arc 3, where Snowdrop is lying to Nicolette, you know? Or not Arc 3, but the interlude. So, there's stuff like that. Um, some other highlights I wanted to touch on was uh, Verona does, like, kind of explain why she has such little hope in the future. Pretty much every adult in her life has let her down in a way or another. Um, Yeah, it's, like, she's so... She's pretty much seen the worst of what, like, suburban adult life could be. Yeah. It's like, oh, divorced, depressed, shitty job, you know, all this this stuff. So she's like, I, I, I guess her... She's like, hey, if that's what adult life is like, then I don't want to even do this human shit, you know? I don't want to be an adult. But yeah. uh, it's it, like, it, no, it's, you just have, like, an exceptionally shitty circumstance. It's true, but, like, what... what, what? I mean, because she can look at, like, Lucy and Avery's families, for example, and, like, Avery's family is exhausting, but I feel like there's so much of a bond between, like, Avery and Sheridan. Um... Lucy's yeah. family is pretty solid. They got their issues, but like I think Lucy's mom and and especially Booker are good role models. So like, Avery's got or Verona has no one, you know. Yeah. 
uh she only has the girls but, so it's a little bit edgy but also as a 13 year old like i think that edginess is good it's it's like a little bit too angsty but like that's good in this context yeah. uh Verona, talk about any, let's talk about her dad I do want to talk about her dad. Any interaction with Veronica's dad is so uncomfortable. And like, it's some of the, there's some of the most entertaining moments of the story for me, Truly. despite how uncomfortable I am. I'm, crin- I'm cl- cringing in pleasure. Like he, Verona's Bro- dad is a extremely fucking well written character. <laughs> yes, uh, that is so accurate. There's this one interaction. Where Verona, like, she walks into the room and her dad is under the cover sweaty. And then they have this uncomfortable conversation. I'm just like, what were you doing before she got here? I'm just so suspect. Yeah, and, like, he, like he's sitting in bed without a shirt on. And he's, like, eating snacks, watching a movie. And he's like, how about I put a shirt on and you and your friend come sit on the bed and watch a movie with me? And you're like, yeah! <laughs> yeah, that's right. Because uh, I think Avery was was with her at the time right yeah uh actually i will say i am almost done with 3.1 i was just listening um as i was playing a little bit of league earlier uh not necessarily the best companion for pale but verona and her dad are like exploding at each other right now where i'm at and oh god her dad is just the worst like the biggest hypocrite He's, he's talking about, like, all your manipulations of, and like, you don't understand how much it costs for me to uh, pay for both of us. And I'm just like, you're just, it's, it's a little bit over the top, to be honest. Like, he's so pathetic. Um, but in the context of the story, it really highlights just, like, how shitty this relationship is between Verona and He's the most and powerful man-child in the world. That's, man-child's a good w- word to use there. Um... I mentioned earlier Booker's talk with Lucy. Super cute. Um, Booker's a good guy. I like him. Uh, I like how she's yeah. kind of jealous of his girlfriend. <laughs> but I think that's so yeah, normal. That's, like she... that's, that's just because like, she loves her brother so much that it's just like, I mean, nobody's going to ever be good enough. So Yeah, exactly. Um, she's like, what's so good about her? What I, di- what I didn't like was like Lucy's incredibly sketchy excuse and her parents kind of going with it. I, I that that kind of took me out of the story for a bit. I was like, "There's there's just no way." There's just. I, yeah, I, I feel I, like if I was her dad, I'd be like, "Okay, hold on." Yeah, <laughs> and like being an only daughter, you know, like she's the only. Well, no, well, no, she's not. She's the younger sibling. But I feel like the younger sibling is the one who is to be coddled, and and uh, usually is the one who people have more care for, you know. But I digress. I, think, uh, I could be misremembering, but I think at the very least, like, uh, Lucy's mom knows Lucy talked to Booker about yeah. going out. And she's like, you know what? Booker's going to do what's best for Lucy. So I think she's like, if Booker's cool with it, then maybe. <laughs> oh, man. But I'm, not sure. I'm not sure. I could be misremembering. Booker's so cool if, 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 like, even his mom is like, well, I mean, if Booker says it's all right. <laughs> <laughs> it's like... <laughs> I don't know. Well, can I go out? Like, ask your brother. Ask your brother. <laughs> uh, we also got introduced to Lucy's aunt, which was uh, she's cool. Um, she's like yeah. she's like that like walking wreck who is really lovable, you know? Yeah, the cool aunt. Uh, I I thought the argument for who gets to be Alpina's familiar was quite good. Uh, yeah. Cool. Oh man, people talk about that a lot. <laughs> really? In oh what, yes. In what context? There's just theories getting thrown around. Okay, okay, I, okay, okay, cool, cool, cool. Uh, I'll, I'll pay attention to that plot point. Uh, um, the trial happened. Uh, so, to be fair, while the trial was during one of the worst drives home I've ever had, a three-hour drive from Dallas to Austin with the worst traffic, and I was just like, I, I, was, I was not in the best mood to go through such a complex portion of the story so i understand 2.9 very fan favorite chapter i was just like what the who the fuck is this wolf what is happening what is why is snowdrop so mean <laughs> that's not the case uh yeah but... it uh it, it's it this is like definitely a fan favorite chapter uh and this is a chapter where like when it the night it came out like everyone went to the discussion thread and i think 
most people who read this chapter the night it came out like immediately reread it at the end once they realized Snowdrop was lying the whole time. Yeah. That... And God, it's entertaining. Because like they were like Avery runs into an evil possum on the trail. Or I, yeah. I guess whatever. And the, the evil possum's like, Snowdrop's been lying to you the entire time from the start. <laughs> and it's funny how to reread because you're like, Yeah, I mean the evil one's telling the truth. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um Oh man. Uh, I do, I do think this concept of like doing a trial and then it's kind of like getting a class in an RPG. She'll get the class of Finder. Yeah, I, I believe it also mentions that Nicolette had the cartographer. Like she's a cartographer. She she like finished that trial. I might have uh, misunderstood that. Yeah, I think like Nicolette's official title would be an auger. No, yeah, she's uh, an auger, but I believe she did one of these trials as well. Yeah, I think she did. Yeah. Uh, I could be wrong. Um, which, I mean, to wrap this up, Nicolette was introduced. Uh, she's just like, she's got all these health issues. And um, what, so there's this portion where like she, I think she slips. What was it where she's like in the bathtub bleeding and they just leave her there for like a day? Yeah, that shit was horrifying. That's basically how she got. So in this world there's like people who are awakened which is like oh you do the awakening ritual and then you can see others and you can do magic and all that shit yeah but there's also people who are aware who are like they're not awakened but they're like kind of on the edge between the normal world and the magic world hmm. and like there's different ways to become aware and kind of what happened to her is i think it was her brother like who is the spoiled one in the family like struck her Yes, and it so, yeah, cracked, yeah. She cracked her skull in the bathtub and she was fully conscious but could not move for days. And uh, I, I think they said like the spirits were just like kind of took an interest to her. Yeah. Uh, so I thought that was fucking horrifying. Yeah, that's one way to put it. Um, she's got like a thing on her head now as a result of that incident. She from a from an early age she had like a visual problems, right? Uh, yeah. I do like seeing the, like, encounter in the woods before the trial from her point of view, where uh, she yeah. gets, like, blinded by glamour, right? Like, she believes she's blinded, but she's not really blinded. Is that how that works? Yeah, it's it's some cool glamour stuff, because, yeah. like, whenever it happens, I think, from her perspective, her eyeballs are gone. It's like her eyeballs exploded or something. Jesus. And Alex is like, you need to trust me, you're all right. And she doesn't do it right away. And whenever her eyes do get better, he's like, if you would have believed me when I said you were all right, you would have recovered quicker. And I'm like, that's some glamour shit right there. Well, so Nicolette's trying to join another coven, and she's trying to get, like, an upper hand so she has something to, like, present for that coven. Yeah, that's... Yeah. Now, why did she join the Institute again? I completely missed that portion. I think they might have specifically, uh, sucked, like, seeped her out. They got in her? Like, Alexander and his cohorts are all augers. They right. do stuff, like, see the future. Yeah, they yeah. see remotely. And uh, when she became aware, she had some of those abilities. So it's like, oh, she's kind of like a kind of like an intern of sorts. Yeah, she, she uh, seems but, like she's in the bottom of the totem pole because everyone kind of shits yeah. on her. But she's like, wow, Alexander and his dudes are kind of shitty people. So what if I can take their secrets and join this coven full of cool witch ladies instead? <sighs> That's the thing, right? Like... This is clearly setting up, like, this is going to be really important, but in that frustrating drive, all these new character names got dropped, and I was just like, I, I barely, I barely am in love with our main characters, and I, I, I can't be having, like, five new characters introduced along with the current, like, antagonist of Nicolette, alongside the Hungry Choir as an antagonist, with the overarching mystery of the Carnivine Beast, like, it's... There's a lot yeah. going on right now. Um, it does kind of remind me of, I think it's either like arc five or six of Worm or whatever, where they introduce like four villain teams at once. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, yeah. That was some it, of the most frustrating like, times to, to be listening to Worm. It, it's, it's easier for me to remember villain teams because it's like, oh, these are people with wacky names and distinct costumes and superpowers. Yeah. And uh, Alexander's cohort is like a bunch of like dudes three of which have, like, the same last name, so... Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so where I'm at now, I do love all of them. Cool. So. 
I mean, hopefully I'll get there. But I, that does wrap up pale. So, like, the primary weaknesses I'm hitting right now. and I So, one is the dialogue for Lucy and Veronica. And I've talked to you about this. I think it's too mature. And don't get me wrong. I think teenagers are smarter than we give them credit for. But I also think the vocabulary that these teenagers w- use are better than the vocabularies of adults I know. Yeah, I remember I was talking to you about this. And I was like, I don't think it's that far-fetched. And then I thought about it, and I was like, you know, I don't think the average adult uh, is as smart as these kids. I think, so. And to prove my point, I, I'm going to go back and try to find some Lucy like dialogue and pick out like the words that bother me because there's always like a word or a phrase where I'm like, this is like very – like these words are – too big for a normal teenage girl to be saying and i mean even these a normal like like i th- i think in counter example evan evan's a little younger than them but i love evan's evan dialogue Pax. evan and Pax talks like a little fucking kid and, I love it. <laughs> and he's younger also he's fractured because of that but like his personality still gets through um i think some of the like and this was also a problem with uh worm where because of, like, everyone having, like, a pretty good vocabulary, a lot of characters sounded samey, and I feel like that's something Wild Bo, um improved throughout his writing process in Worm. I think Pat has yet to really run into that problem. Like, Blake is so distinct from Rose, is so distinct yeah. from Maggie um, in dialogue, I feel. And they all... Yeah, I can't wait to get to the packed half of this video, because... It's yeah. just the best story ever. Uh, we were going to do like a 30, 40 minute for both, but we just we just hit 30 minutes for Pale alone. Um, pacing wise, Pale also is kind of running into some issues. And it's the opposite issue of Worm where I'm like, man, these fights kind of drag on. This is like, these conversations are long. Like the beginning of 3.1 b- before Verona goes and like has the meeting with her dad was 20 minutes worth of audiobook of them just kind of like expositioning. I'm like, yeah, oh, fuck. I, can't, I can't remember which chapter it is. I think it might be Nicolette's interlude, but I think that one set the record for the long, the biggest work. Count Nicolette's in interlude was dead ass two hours, a little bit over two hours. So, uh, whenever I saw that it was the longest chapter he ever wrote, but also Pale was supposed to be like a shorter story, I was like, press X to doubt. But <laughs> I'm like, don't get me wrong, I do like Pale a lot. But, like, <laughs> I think Pat is just objectively better. Yeah, I mentioned earlier, I'm not in love with the main characters yet. I think, so, like, I like Lucy's don't give a shit. Like, I liked her telling Paul off. Uh, yeah. I like how she's the only one with a brain in the group. However, again, it, like, the maturity issue gets to me. She's, pro- like, Verona is pretty cool. I do like Verona. I can see Verona plausibly being a 13-year-old girl. Uh, yeah, she's the most 13-year-old. Uh, Avery is too, with the big yeah. lesbian horniness. The th- yeah, right? I just don't really love Avery. Like, Lucy like doesn't really do much for me. Uh, the thing is, and I think this is why Wild Bo always could never really get his guts and glory story that he wanted to do, you know, like in Worm, where he wanted to do um, Panacea and Glory Girl, right? Yeah. I feel like this is maybe what he realized would be the issue is that like every chapter I'm jumping to a new protagonist. So I feel like I've gotten one third of what I would have gotten from Taylor in the like same amount of time in Blake, you know? Oh, so it's like instead of getting like a hundred percent of beats in development for a character, it's like you get a third or half or something. Yeah. And when, and when so far, almost all of that is, how their family shape these characters and how these characters talk with miss and like it's a lot of talking with one of the others or talking with a family member and i'm like I, it's just not doing it for me character wise yet um I feel you. i'm not dropping it yet but it is i i'm just full disclosure and honesty it is a potential drop i want to give arc three a shot now you would know better bradley like do you think arc three is a good drop point or you're like oh no that one's more of the same issues but arc four though might be what you're looking for like how do you think that would play uh i think some cool ass shit happens in both arc three and four okay cool uh like 
arc two would definitely be the least action heavy arc of the story. Um, but usually the action is like condensed in the like near the end of each arc. Mm-hmm. Uh, but there's some, there are some cool fucking fights. There's some bombs dropped in the uh, context of the Carmine Beast mystery. That's exciting. Yeah, cool. I'm I'm I'm, so, I'm I'm keen to get back to the mystery stuff. But that being said, if you were <laughs> wondering what to spend your free time on, I'm confident you would like more packs better. Speaking of packed. Speaking of packed. Okay, guys, packed is better than worm for me right now. It, I, like I never thought it could be true, but it, it's true. Packed <laughs> Pact is so good. I can't believe this is like the hated one or like the not popular one. This is incredible. <laughs> yeah, because, you know, I read Worm and then I had years of lurking the subreddit. And I've always, I'd always seen people saying like, man, you know, Pact, you know, it. we don't blame Wild though. It's hard to follow up Worm. Or like, oh, I don't <laughs> like Pact's pacing. Or like, you know, it just didn't hit as much. And so I had never tried it. And then I don't, I don't even know what prompted me to try it but i tried it and i was like what the fuck this is the best book ever i think like i was finishing worm and i was like man is packed really like should i should i not do it and then i think you gave it a try and you're like wait no this is pretty interesting and I, the the character arc of bradley liking pact was kind of cool because like in the first arc it was almost disbelief at how good it was i, I that's yeah. the vibe i got that you were giving out um so when we talked about Pact, which I do believe we did a video, I think we covered arcs one through three, where three ends on the incre- oh my god, I'm just remembering that one chapter where Blake is a little kid in a Duchamp like ritual. God. That was incredible. But like, oh yeah, three ends with like the bombshell that like, oh, we put a time spell. You can no longer enter the uh, what what what's the the Thorburn estate, and it's like, oh yeah, cool, you lost. The end of arc three, me and Willow were just like, Blake lost the story. Yeah. Like, he lost, like, if this was a game, that's a game over and he has no more lives. So after that, we were like, what is the story now? You're telling me there's 13 arcs after the story <laughs> just ended? <laughs> like, And man, it and just keeps getting better, even. So this portion of the story is Blake back in Toronto, meeting up with his friends again. Um, him getting Conquest 3 tasks. Now, it's been a long time since I read Arc 4. I'll, I'll ask a question in a section. Uh, getting the three tasks from Conquest, which are the that animal demon who summons a bunch of animals, the hyena, and the abstract demon. And then the jail sequence is in the middle of that. Uh, how did he get under Conquest's thumb again? Uh, basically, it's like, when you're walking into a city, you it's kind of good form to talk to the lord of that city. Yeah. It, it's similar to how, like, if you enter someone's house, you don't ignore them. And then he just straight up went, right? Like, Fel showed up, and then he's like, hey, come with me, let's go meet Conquest. And then Conquest, like, forcibly took Rose, as I recall. That's how it played out. Fel, Fel reminds me of, like, Mike from Breaking Bad. That's what I was thinking! <laughs> <laughs> I was like, man, f- uh, the, one of the notes I wrote is like, Fel hates Blake so much, but the only person <laughs> he hates more is Conquest. Oh, yes. Oh, man. Um, Bradley, where are you in Pact right now? You're like in six, right? So I ended arc seven, and oh, uh, I, I've taken a break at the end of arc seven for two reasons. I think because uh, uh, I initially started Pact doing the audiobook, driving to and from work, whatever Which is a fantastic I had to drive to and from work. And guys, like the, the packed audiobook that is with Media MD is so high quality. I think the reader's really, really good. Yeah. I think he does a distinct enough voice for each character too, which I think is really good. Yeah, the readers and, are incredible. Uh, and I don't know. I really like it. But and so is the uh, gonna... interlude readers are all solid as well. Yeah. So at the time I was doing that, I think the audiobook ended around arc six. So I finished the audiobook and then I kept reading. And then I think arc seven, the end of arc seven feels like a good stopping point. Like anybody in Worm, they'll be like, hey, you know, if you had to have a stopping point, it would be after arc eight, after yeah. Leviathan. And the end of arc seven in Pact is I'm like, okay, if I'm ever going to take a break, it would be right here. Makes sense. So I can go back to you know, doing other stuff like One Piece, all the other stuff we do on our channel, yeah. so. 
Cool, cool, cool. Uh, I'm, I'm so six is pretty long. So next time we talk about Pact, it's probably gonna be like maybe all of six or like six until seven point five. Yeah. Um, because I don't wanna, I don't wanna do every arc necessarily. Um, it might get a little excessive, but I do want to checkpoint in on both of our progress on Pact. Yeah. So yeah, some of my favorite portions of this part include. Uh, so I love the ever-present threat of the lawyers trying to get Blake to, I, it's get him so karmically bankrupt that he's forced to work with them. Right, that's the yeah. general idea. Man, I love what one of the lawyers do. The the uh, lady one, yeah. I think she might be blonde. Yes, like him she work. straight up. Yeah, whenever she's giving Blake his like tutorial fight against the fairy, where. We, I think you're, you're the one who first referred to it as a tutorial fight, yeah. but it really is teaching you how to fight in the Pactiverse. And, yeah. like, I think she tells him, hey, you know, I, I'm, I'm only being nice to you because I'm hoping that you're going to join us one day. And, you know, if I get the vibe that you're not going to do it, I'm going to stop helping you. And despite this, like, he... There, there are moments where he'll, like, think in his head that, you know, I can rely on the lawyers. And I'm like, you know, it's like, man, like what she's doing is working. Like, you know, he, he was beginning to I, do I, these people as allies. I think he's in such a shit position that the lawyers, like, they just have to maneuver it carefully enough and they'll get his ass. Like, he's so fucked. Like, eventually, eventually he's going to have to work with for them. And, like, that's the way they see it, I believe. Because it's like, yeah. he's just such a bad position. And kind of a theme of this portion of the story and the story so far for me is that like Blake is a terrible practitioner because he's just too human. He's such a good person in my eyes and like, yeah. he's so grounded and, and kind and uh, empathetic that those saying those words and seeing every other opponent that he faces every other, literally like the word other and every, uh, practitioner that he fights are so cold blooded with it. You're like, and even like compared to Rose, you're just like Blake. You, Blake, you are so out of your element. Yeah, I think even in his grandma's survival guide, she's like, you're gonna get, have to get married to someone, and you know, I know the usual usual strategy with marriage is find someone you click really well with, someone who's a good person. But she's like, historically, the Thorburn family has just done better off when you marry bastards yeah literally like the literal word you know, just go marry some bastard out there like just someone who it'll just work out better for you um i like the portion where blake sees all his friends again just because it was like it was the perfect yeah. pace breaker i don't remember the details but like it, it just felt really good to meet the squad um i believe this is when he gets a proposition for a threesome and i'm just like oh you fucking chad <laughs> Yeah, and it's like, it's so easy to view that as just like Blake being shown in protagonist who doesn't care about girls. But as you go on, like, it becomes more increasingly obvious that he has, like, very huge problems with being touched by anybody, I think. Yeah, in the in the prison section, like, he even has a passage, and I, I noted on this because it, it felt like a very touchstone part of, like, Blake's trauma that he probably faced when he was homeless was um, he he doesn't like put much stock in his own sexuality like it's something he enjoys, but it's not a focus for him. And I I, I don't know that just seems really grounded. Like man, you're a cool dude, Blake. I, yeah. I I get where you're coming from, given what I is what is almost certainly what happened to you when you were homeless. But uh, yeah. I have no confirmations one way or the other. Uh. Conquest Lair was pretty cool. Uh, it's like it's just very abstract stuff once again. Yeah, I want to I want to see it in a TV show or something because it's so unlike anything. It's it's so unlike any setting we see before it. it so it's like oh he's gonna go see the Lord of the City and then he walks into this building and it's like endless and there's these towers and shit and you're like what the fuck? You know what's great about Pact so far? Every single arc is so wildly different from the other as far as like yeah what the encounter of that arc is and what we're doing because yeah like this arc um the first like the, it, so eventually like there's a portion 
where Blake's at the store with Tiffany's girlfriend and he gets attacked by Paul, uh, who is an other, right? I forgot what the deal with Paul was. It's been, I, wonder, uh, I think they're satyrs. Yes, maybe? they're satyrs. Uh, who, they're, they're the ones who they met early on and they were like calling Blake Rose, right? Yeah, and that's really cool because it's not just them. I think others, other others do it too, like fairies. Like, yeah. I think Tadrig in Jacob's Bell, like, seriously did not realize Blake. I'm thinking, of, I'm thinking of Tadrig. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, but yeah, like he did not realize Blake was a different human than Rose Senior. <laughs> seems, uh, seems like that's building up for something because, like, clearly. There's some sketchy stuff Rose set into motion with current Rose. Rose Senior, oh. I think, is the way to refer. Do you know things? Have, have, have things been revealed? I ain't saying nothing. Ah, fuck. Okay. I say that. Um, a big thing in this arc is Rose and Blake talking paws into turning on Conquest, which is a big portion, I think, of what's about to happen. Dude, and man, the packs, packs like non shown in battle, shown in arc was everything is that it was like everything really and yeah you know what there's not i was about to say d every arc is that but yeah. when he blake is drafting the contract with pals and like the entire contract is going back and forth in his mind like oh if i put this clause in he could fuck me over doing this but then you know i don't get anything from that it's so meticulous and that the conclusion to that chapter was so perfect because he just spent the whole chapter perfecting this contract he's like okay there shouldn't be anything he can do to fuck me over like as soon as we sign this contract all of his abilities are turned off and so they sign the contract and Powell smiles and Blake's like wait all of his abilities are turned off and those were the only things keeping these animals from mauling Blake <laughs> and that is right. Okay, I, I, in my mind I was like after the contract Paul's fucked them over somehow but I can't remember how yeah, the, the demon, the or I don't think he's a demon. I think he's an imp. Like yeah, a he's an imp. But he's like, yeah, okay, when we sign the contract, I'm going to stop everything I'm doing to these animals. And he does, and then the animals start mauling the shit out of Blake. And like, dude, when Blake is getting attacked by this deer, I had this thought oh, that... Oh, fuck. Blake is getting attacked by this deer, and it, it feels like the same intensity to me as like the echidna fight in worm thank you so much for remembering for reminding me of that deer fight because like i felt like chest tightening as the super aggressive deer fights blake yeah like blake is getting antlered and <laughs> he uh, I, I think in worm other characters even comment to taylor like what the fuck is your pain threshold and she's like i think i I think I got my pain threshold fucked up by Bakuda, but <laughs> like Blake, he gets antlered, and he's like, I "I'm trying to stand up, but like my brain is just telling me leg hurt. I can't do anything else, you know." Yeah, Blake gets beat the fuck up in these two arcs. Um, uh, so, wait, pause is the demon with the animals, right? So that's yes, that's what yes. that was. Okay, cool. I just trying to piece my memories together here. Um, I, in the story encounter, I did mention it with Tiffany's girlfriend. Like I wrote down that like Blake was just giving me such good vibes when talking to this girl. Cause this girl also seems yeah. to like, she seems really shy. She seems like, um, she needs to make some new friends and like Blake is just so friendly to her and he's so good at like calming her down as they're discreetly being attacked by these satyrs. I just, yeah. And I think, uh. I think Alexis, which is their mutual friend who introduced him. Yes. I think specifically that's why she tried to hook Blake up with Tiffany because they kind of have that physical reservedness in common. And she's like, Blake's not going to force himself on this girl or yeah. anything. That's, that's a good point. Um, yeah, Alexis, that's the name that I was blanking on there. Okay, so the next big thing for me was the hyena encounter. This shit was just crazy because... As I recall, the thing with the hyena is when it kills you, it just, like, leaves your soul to, like, be tortured in the place it killed you forever. Yeah, and it's like he's killed all these things in these woods over the years. So, like, the first time Fell drives Blake by these woods, there's just, like, all kinds of others fucking staring at them driving by. <laughs> yes, yes. The good memory, yeah. That was a cool section. Um... 
So this is where we meet Evan and y'all. Evan is was the missing spice to make this the perfect story. I think Evan bounces off of Blake so well, and I am so invested in their friendship. Like it, it just it does so much for me. They, it, it, it's really weird. I would, I wouldn't be able to explain why I like Evan so much. Like it's, it's because he's such a, a tortured kid, you know. Like, like I, you get the sense that Evan almost doesn't realize like how weird his existence is. Um. But he just wants to help so much. And you're like, oh. Also, the reader gives like I don't think Evan's dialogue is like super childish, but the reader of the audiobook makes it extra childish, and then you just want to protect Evan. But all Evan yeah. wants to do is protect Blake. So you're just like, oh and my heart. They just have such good chemistry. Where Evan, like t- technically Rose and Blake are allies, but there's. It, every once in a while, it feels like there's bad blood there because yeah. Blake's in the driver's seat. It, it, Evan is just a bastion for Blake. Like, it's someone who Blake is like, yeah, this kid is on my side. And, like, for example, when they're going in to fight the, like, abstract erasure demon, yeah, you know, I think Rose is like, okay, we need, a, we need a signal if something goes wrong. And Blake's like, if something goes wrong, just scream. And she's like, don't be an asshole. And... Blake says I'm not at the exact same time Evan says he's not. And then Rose and I, like rolls her eyes. I just imagine them giving finger guns to each other. <laughs> oh man, like part of part of like what made Evan immediately endearing is how like he struggled talking at first, right? Because like he he was kind of echoey, kind of like June at the start. Now th- there's like a mystery surrounding, from what I understand, what Evan really is. Because it's he's not like a traditional spirit, but I, I don't know if they've really gone out and said like yeah what so his exact I, deal is. I mean, the idea is that he he's like a he's a similar ghost to June, but uh, I think ghosts like degrade over time. And yeah. Evan was like a a very recent death, like so recent that it's still in the papers or something. Right. So he hasn't degraded enough. Like there's still some like conscious thought there. And then I think when Blake makes him his familiar, it like kind of breathes life into it, makes him more mortal for lack of a better word. Right. That makes sense. Yeah. They, they, they struck a couple of beats during that portion where it's like by being his familiar, he's alive again, quote unquote. In, in a certain way. Um, I do like how Blake is able to actually beat the hyena. Like, it's good when Blake gets a win. Uh, I, as So, part of it is, like, he does this intricate thing by, like, ch- tying these chains and getting Holly to, like, make the chains, like, bind the hyena. But also, he didn't he threaten to turn s- something on the hyena? Like He might have. I think he still had the imp bound so maybe he was like yo i got an imp and if you don't fucking yeah. submit yeah 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 because like from from what i remember he like he's so, he's like talking shit to this incredibly aggressive monster and he's yeah. just like sitting down as it's binded and like talking like talking it into submission and i was just and like that, this is so dope. badass and like the way in which he binds it this isn't something Walvo had to do but i thought just like the moment it's found was so cool because like the hyena doesn't talk in English. So the hyena is a goblin and goblins are supposed to be like just the, the most base gross impulses of humans. And like he said, the hyena makes a noise and it wasn't English, but it was just such a base sound in the human instinct that Blake was able to recognize it as the hyena saying, I submit. Yeah, uh, that was so good. I'm I'm really glad that you're better at remembering the details than I am. Because yeah, that, I remember like getting feeling so proud that Blake accomplished that by himself, basically, with Evan's help, of course. And like, I don't know, that thing I said, like it's not even an important thing to remember. It, but I, I just did because I thought it was so cool. This does have like, I think this was the line, like it has this portion, this exchange... Which is like I went from really liking Pact to like absolutely loving Pact. Is when Blake is trying to reassure, like he's talking to Evan, 
And he's like, Evan, don't blame yourself for oh. getting killed. And I'm going to butcher this completely. But then he's like, and this is maybe something that I should be saying to myself. And I hope that I'm like being honest with myself when I say this. But like, we are both not to blame for the things in our past. And just like, you're assuming like you've heard these vague things of all this tough time Blake had when he was homeless. And yeah. him finding some therapy through Evan and like seeing seeing Evan is able to snap him out of it and be like, man, truly like it's not our fault for the horrible things in our past. Yeah. And if I can tell if I can help Evan understand this, maybe I can feel a little bit better about it as well. Like it's just so synergistic and it makes makes you feel so good. It gives me goosebumps because he was like, Evan it's gonna kill me if you blame yourself for all the stuff that happened to you because you didn't choose for this to happen to you. I chose to run away from my parents. Yeah. And he's like, so if you're blaming yourself, like, you know, what does that say for me? Yeah, oh, and so good. It's just so good. And then it just gets better from there because... It just gets and, better. And this is what Pale's missing for me right now. He goes to visit Evan's corpse and he throws out the idea of them being a familiar... And I'm like, fuck, yes, do it. I want Evan more in the story. But then the cops show up, and it's just such a good, like, segue into the next portion of the story. It instantly builds so much tension. It got me so hyped to do Arc 5. Um, and god damn. Like, in this next arc, is, is, is this, so is this is the one where he's in the police station, right? Yes, before we go there real quick, there's an interlude where it's, like, the son of a diabolist who was still religious... Was that someone I was supposed to know? Um, or what? So, I think that interlude is, like, passages from a in-universe book called yes. Black Lamb's Blood. Yeah. And Black Lamb's Blood, the lawyers basically gave this book to Blake, and they told him to read it. And they're like, this is an explanation for why being a Diabolist isn't so bad. And actually, you know, more people probably should be Diabolists. And so... <laughs> That's how they explained it. But it was like a trap. The, like they, they were like, "This is a this is entrapment yeah. right here." So the lawyers who want Blake to be a diabolist, that's how they explained it. Every single other character who has mentioned Black Lamb's blood in the setting said it's horrible propaganda that makes more diabolists in the world. Don't listen to it. <laughs> I love that. That's so. Oh God, what a setting. This is so good. God damn. Uh, so the prison arc was incredible. Oh my god! Oh my god! god. Oh, this my was god. so good. Um, man, it was, it was the perfect arc, and also like, it was really six out of the eight chapters that was the prison arc because the last two are dealing with the abstract demon. So like, just arc four was just the best arc. It had too much good stuff. It somehow the highs that were set in arc three. I didn't think would be reached very soon, if at all. And we already did it again, I think. Dude, like, in, uh, I think it's Duncan Beheim. Yeah. Uh, cause <laughs> I think the Duchamps are like the blonde people, right? Right, right. I wrote but, Duncan Duchamp, you're right. Yeah, Duncan Beheim. I, I was saying that, like, Blake's contract with the imp was the non battle, battle shonen. No. This entire the interrogation arc. room is the fucking non battle, battle shonen. <laughs> That was so good because Blake can't lie. What a, like, duh, what a good premise. Like, the I, I think that interrogation room is the shining moment of why all dialogue and pact is so good, not being able to lie, because you have these officers, and one of them is, like, a mortal enemy of Blake, and he's like, I've got Blake's ass. He's like, Mr. Thorburn, do you ever, you know see ghosts and goblins that and was shit. So, good. And so Blake is like, I'm fucked because if I don't answer, I'm not cooperative. If I lie, I'm forsworn and then I'm just fucked. And if I tell the truth, I'm obviously crazy. So they're going to put me in jail. And he's like, I mean, I'm op I'm open-minded. You know, we haven't proved everything, <laughs> you know, that, you know. <laughs> that was such a good sidestep to that. It's oh. So good. The, the interrogation also gives us a little bit, more insight into Blake and his like touching phobia as they're like yeah. they're needling him like they're just being like they're, they're being 2020 cops if you know what I mean like they're really pissing me off in this heart oh yeah Ugh. um 
Uh, yeah, like, Duncan made such a great antagonist because he he's a police officer who's got Blake right where he wants him, and he knows how to defeat someone in this situation. Uh, and the... The time loop, when they introduced the time loop element, I lost my shit. I know, I was like, yo, Blake fucking what, get fucked, Duncan. And then you see Duncan doing magic shit right in front of everybody, and you're like, <laughs> is he allowed to do that? And then it time loops, and you're like, no! no! <laughs> this entire, like, cat and mouse they're having with Duncan discreetly using magic, aside from that one time where it's very explicit. Doesn't he also summon Father Time or some shit? Like, he summons this familiar I think, I think, I, I, who is, like, basically... That, it, it might be his familiar. It's... it's I, I can't remember. It's either his familiar or just some other that, like, works with the Behind family. Yeah, it's just so cool that, like, this family has all these intricate time looping. But then also, like, isn't there's this portion where, like, Blake is in a almost never-ending, like, staircase? Yeah. It's like, how long yeah, have you he, been running down these stairs? Yeah, he's running down the staircase, and he's like, are you fucking shitting me? I thought this was only, like, two or three floors. <laughs> I will say that, like, so Blake summoning Rose and almost, like, he bleeds himself out, basically. Very worrisome. Uh, I feel like this is, like, it's treated with the weight where, like, this might be something that is damning Blake for the rest of the story. Like, yeah, it's like when Taylor goes blind, I believe she gets her eyes back eventually, but this is like, this gives me the vibe that like, Oh, Blake's blind for the rest of the story now. Yeah. Like I, I think this has like repercussions like borderline permanently. And he does that just to summon Rose. Um, there's a bunch of cool applications of magic here. Uh, Evan's path findings, always super cool. Rose being able to shatter glass, but then also come out of the glass and, like, claw at people. I thought yeah. that was super cool. Um, Duncan's elongated stairwell. And the, the stairway fight, or, like, I think it, the way it works is, like, Duncan was looking at them from a window that Blake had to jump through. And, yeah. And then he, I think he goes back downstairs, and he doesn't want to get too close to Blake. But he's still, like, on top of the stairway. And Evan, like, leaves but then shows up again to yell right into Duncan's ear, which causes him to fall down and they're just wrestling for the taser. Yeah. And Rose is just, like, clawing out of the glass. It it wasn't, it, like, it was the right amount of length. It was all highlights. It wasn't the, ki the kind of action I would complain about in Worm. It was just cool uh, strategies employed, and it was fast-paced. And, like, that's God. exactly what I want for my Wild Bow fights. Pact is the best manga ever. It, man and Matt, it pisses me off that this is this is the one that Wild this is Bo, the one this is the one that Wild Bo has sworn off not publishing. Yeah, I, like, I read his retrospectives on all of his books, even the ones that I haven't finished. And uh, I don't know if it's a ret retrospective for Pact, but it's in one of them where he's like, uh, he's like, yeah, Pact is my favorite setting I've made, so I'm gonna revisit it, which I think was before he started Pale. He's yeah. like. It's def he's like, it's my favorite setting I've made. I'm going to revisit it, but yeah, I don't think I'll ever try to get Pact published. And I was like, but it's your best one. Uh, yeah, it's such a bummer. Uh, to wrap out the arc, we have the abstract demon fight after Blake. Uh, Blake utilizes June in really cool ways to get like Duncan to drop the thing and Bird Evan shows up. It's just all these cool little things that happen at the end of the arc. To Basically, he wins by getting Duncan's ass exposed and it just felt really good. Oh um, my god. So, with the abstract fight, I, I now love, like, this trio that we've created of Rose, Blake, and Evan. Where, like, Rose, Evan and Blake are friends, and just Rose and Blake are always bickering. But they, I feel like, and, and Blake points this out, it's like, Rose does ground me sometimes where I get too, a little bit too gung-ho with some of my plans. Rose's bickering actually serves to, like, ground me. So, God, Rose is handling it so well. And I'm saying that knowing that she yells at him on the reg. <laughs> exactly, right, yeah. He's like, yelling at him constantly is probably even better than I would be handling her situation. Yeah, like, I, I love the character. Like, this is such a good main character trio we have right now. I love <clears throat> Duncan. Like, Duncan was more interesting to me than the Pale Girls are right now. That, that's a problem for me. Because he was like Dude, a one-time okay, minor villain. He was just like such a shitty little cop. Um, 
so some entities potentially entered Blake. That's unclear for me right now because Fel was like, are you possessed? <laughs> like, yeah. I don't so, know what to say to you right now to prove that I'm not possessed. This is, a, this is a point in the story where something I had been wondering up to this point is like, okay, you know, if I use too much power, what's the big deal? I'm tired for a while. Or like if yeah. I get forsworn, is it like, what, I just can't use magic anymore? What's the big deal? And I think... I think this is where we start to see, like, what are some actual consequences of what could be happening if you lose too much power? Because basically, before this happens, one, Blake borderline bleeds himself dry. Yeah. Which, and by then, the way, they've made a point to stop using your blood as a power source. Like, that yeah. sets bad connotations for the future. And then he bleeds himself dry... And then he does the ritual to take Evan on as his familiar, and he's like, Evan, I won't let any harm come to you. And then immediately after, Evan gets his fucking neck snapped. Oh my god, you're right. And Blake feels his, like, legs come out from under him. Yeah. Because, like, that's... I don't know, I don't know if that's... It's not forsworn, but, like, he said, I'm going to do this for you. That's and then, point. you know, I, it happened to Evan. I didn't think so, it would be for I, I didn't think it was a forsworn thing. But yeah, now that you mentioned that. it, I, I felt like it was some sort of stand, like damage to the familiars being reflected on you, Blake. Yeah. Some, but I don't know if yeah. that's how every familiar works, so that's part yeah. of their special it's, dynamic. I think for I think forsworn is specifically like if someone like makes an oath or a promise and someone else has to call them out on it. Yeah. But in any case, like this might have been some karma bullshit. Yeah, these two things took so much out of Blake, and now he's like, I'm kind of half in the real world, half in the spirit world. That was so weird. And he's back in the real world now, right? He he. Yeah. When he went back into the uh, prison, into the jail the house, he got back in, I believe. Yeah, and so Fell, as soon as he sees Blake, he like gets his gun and he's like, "Are like, are you Blake? Like, <laughs> yeah. or, or, or are you something else?" And so. I think whenever you are expending that much power of yourself, either through, you know, actually using your power, bleeding it out, or telling lies, I think it means you're opening the way for something else to enter you. Because I think in the same conversation, uh, Fell tells Blake, like, the, the reason some others want your soul isn't because your soul's that valuable. Like, the soul doesn't actually do that much for you. Yeah. It's because whenever they take your soul out, it means they can put something else in. God, so that's if disturbing. using like if using power is like using your soul, then I think Blake using so much power is like opening the way for other things to enter him. And that is just a cool idea for like the long running narrative of the story. I will say, um the uh parahuman subreddit has uh, I'm pretty sure spoiled me on some Blake related plot points later on. Like they will just put some words in a non-spoiler like tag and title where it's oh, like, shit. "Cool, can't wait to see what happens to Blake." You guys, I'm sure, like hidden this well, uh, but yeah, I digress. I, um, I think I'm clean so far, but I don't know. I'm, I'm glad you missed that one because it was just the other day. And it's like, <laughs> like a a very spoilery <laughs> descriptor of Blake. Like, Blake plus spoilery descriptor lands in Kennet. What do you think happens? It's like, I, oh, fuck. I wish you didn't put half of that sentence <laughs> in that. But uh, but anyways, a um, couple of other things. This has the magic as English thing, which I think we talked about the first time we talked Dude, about. Dude, uh, like, Pact. that's part of why I think Pact is so cool. Because every book Wild Bow does, he he wants to try a different experiment. And I think he also might talk a little bit about this in his retrospectives where obviously worm is the reconstruction of the superhero genre. Yeah. It's kind of fun to do. Pale is a writing experiment he's wanted to do since his first book. He's always wanted to try rotating protagonist protagonists. I think for twig, he said he wanted to try like not exclusively, but one of the things he wanted to try was, doing better romance because he recognized that like he didn't think he was that good at writing romance all right um so that's just one element of it and i think the writing experiment for pact is the coolest one where it's like can i make 
literature itself a mechanic in the universe? Because like it's so cool when in, he's in, doing it, dude. Impact tropes are real. Like he he takes things that are tropes in movies, literature, whatever, but they're actual tangible things that affect reality impact. Like for and example, an example is in Pale actually with the yeah. with the trial. Like they were like all these trials are like kind of like fairy tales with like a there's a lesson at the end that is it's like a thematic lesson that you'll see in many stories. Yeah. And the two easiest ones for me are, like, it's just a thing for humans that three is just an interesting number. Like, we have an idiom, third time's yeah. the charm. But in Pact, Literally. that's not an idiom. It's literal. It's a fact that, that on your third time attempting something, you're more likely to achieve it. And the other cool one is, like, you'll notice, I don't know, in movies, people don't necessarily talk how they talk in real life. Because, you know, you want drama. People drama, talk yeah. more dramatically. And so that's a mechanic in Pact where if you talk more dramatically, the spirits are like, yo, yo, that was kind of cool. Uh, part of that comes up in this portion where, like, I think it's Rose talking to the abstract demon and being like, I'm asking you three times, three times, what is your name? And she sounds so fucking dramatic and intense. And you're just like, oh, it's working so well which, like which is fucking cool by the way because it works she makes him say his name but he eats his name so they can't hear it so clever um it's worth noting that in this portion um there is that thing where like apparently there was goblins accompanying them that were forgotten because it like blake is like i think some of our allies just died I'm of two minds yeah. about this. I know you're really into this, and this is like I. It's pretty cool in general. I'll let you speak first on it. Yeah, like I do think, <laughs> I like whenever I initially read that, I was like, "Wait, what the fuck?" And then I read like Thel's interlude where you see the goblins going with Blake, and I'm like, "Yo, that's pretty cool." Yeah, I do think it would have been kind of bullshit, like if there was a character who was around since Arc One that we never heard of because they died in this fight, but. If it's just some throwaway goblins, I'm like, yo, that's pretty cool. That is really cool. It's really clever. The thing that's kind of like, it's weird for me to wrap my head around is like, I think another way Wildbo could have done this is uh, up until the point they're eaten, we talk about these goblins because it doesn't make sense to me that the goblin was eaten mid-chapter so they're not in the beginning of the chapter anymore. Uh but like in a but, way you're saying because it's like you're telling the story from Blake's point of view and like his memory. Yeah. But like but also it's just I don't know. It's Cause that fucking... happens with other things in the fight. Like I don't think we see Blake ever like use his lighter. And yeah. at one point in the chapter he's like, Fuck, I forgot something to light fires with. And he's like, Wait, no. There's fires here. I must have brought something to light fires with. <laughs> That is really cool. Uh, see, I'm, the reason why I'm split is because, like, what if Wildbo did, did it like this? It's like, um, we talk about the goblins, but as soon as they die, we, like, he makes it so explicitly clear that they don't exist in the story anymore. We're like, there is no lamenting. There's not even, like, a... From that point on, Blake just sees, like, some giblets of their leg on the ground, and he can't piece together, but we can. I feel like... I don't know, that might make more sense for a reader. It's, it's it's so abstract, and, like, I can't be too bothered about this because it's cool no matter how you slice it. That he it's cool even, no matter how you slice no, it. No matter, like, what he... Uh, the fact that he attempted this is just badass. Another aspect of this that this that was cool in the uh, Deep Impact podcast done by MediaMD, which is with Doof Media. Which I gotta... Uh, I, I gotta check, check them out. I do have to listen um, to that portion because I haven't done that on yet. On the... Uh, for the actual chapter where Blake is fighting the demon, one thing they pointed out that was really cool is before they go, like the chapter before the demon fight, Rose is like, we're not gonna fight the demon unless you come up with this number of ideas. If you come yeah. up with this number of ideas, we'll fight the demon. And they're like, in this chapter, we don't see him ever try that many ideas. Huh. And then we get the Fells interlude and you see him walk in with the hail like halogen lights that fell said were stupid and it's like you know what <laughs> we didn't see him try that many ideas because one of them got eaten that's clever oh man i don't love it but i respect it so much yeah but i also don't dislike it either now that you talk about it i'm like it's pretty cool this is... you know what you know no. what uh finally we get fell's interlude very cool interlude um 
I specifically like when Conquest shows up and we find out that, like, Fel's dad has been an asshole to him. Like, God. To, like, pro protect him in a weird way. What this a broken man. Never, this book never stops top, topping itself because, <laughs> like, Fel's dad was a practitioner, so he can't lie. Yeah. And he says all this horrible stuff to him, like, I wish you were never born. And, you know, he even purposefully kills their family dog. And then you find out that his father actually loves him very much. And you're like, oh, so the I wish you were never born thing is a lie. And he's like, no, genuinely, because I'm so scared for your future. You're going to have to be a slave to conquest. And I'm like, oh, my God. What a good you like. How many times are we going to say this? But what a good usage of the rules you set up. Yeah. <sighs> he's like, the yeah. only thing I regret is that I was not crueler to you. So you would run away. Jesus, dude. Just the best. And then, like, so now we get the sense that, like, okay, Fel is working against Conquest in his own way. And Blake is kind of a wild card where, like, the power Blake has is very dangerous. And it could, but, like, the fact that Fel has Blake under his thumb means that, or not Fel, sorry, Conquest is Blake under his thumb means Conquest has more power now. So Conquest's power was waning. But now with Blake, it's rising again, which is more reason to hate Blake. But Blake could also be part of uh, Fell's plan to get to Conquest. So the way, the way I see Arc 6 playing out is like, if we are to get out of this alive, because they didn't kill the Abstract Demon, they had to escape, right? So yeah. they're going to have to answer to that whenever they see Conquest next. And man, it's just so good because, you know, everyone hates Diabolists. And the thing <laughs> is, Blake is just trying to survive. And by just trying to survive, he has to do Diabolus shit, because that's what Conquest wants. And then whenever he does that shit to survive, people are like, see, I told you, he's a Diabolus. Fuck this guy. It's it's a lose-lose. Being Blake is suffering. It's a lose -lose. And you know what else is suffering? Rose snitching. My jaw was on the drawer. I mean, what else was she supposed to do? But she didn't even, she didn't even fight it. She just it's like, you can't blame snitched. her, but... You can't blame her, but there was no torture here. This is the classic Hitchcock Hitchcockian bomb under the table now. Ooh. Where we know that he knows, but Blake doesn't know. Unless, like, I hope Rose, if, I mean, but Blake can't just summon Rose, right? He had to, like, almost kill himself to thing. summon her once. Because that's the thing. Like, Conquest grabbed Rose without, you know, warning her ahead of time. And she tells him this. And he doesn't have to let her go back to Blake. So Blake might just not know that Conquest knows. Of course, the best part is Bradley knows, and he knows that <laughs> I, I don't know. know. <laughs> so I, I think we're going to wrap it up here. Um, I'm super excited to do more Pact. I'm apprehensive about the next uh, Pale Arc, but we'll see how that goes. I, I hope I can find a good rhythm uh, for listening to these audiobooks. But man, like... You got me into this wild bull world. You, you know what? If you, it's like when you're a practitioner, a practitioner, and you get someone else in. My karmic you're debt is now yours. God. Uh you you brought me into this world. You gotta you gotta look out for me. I uh, it, it's just so insane to me that, like, by the the first arc, I thought was so good, and it has not stopped topping itself. And apparently six and seven are supposed to also be good. The six and seven are also the same trend. It's the, insane. Clearly, clearly packed must shit itself the last six arcs. It's uh, the it, only way. It has to, or else people it, I don't know. It's the only way that this isn't a modern classic by all see, definitions. Okay. Keep uh, like the most often reason I see cited that people don't like packed is because like it's paced too fast, but I think there cannot be a story that is paced more perfectly. Yeah, Every so chapter is a complete story where the beginning of the chapter will be like addressing the bomb that was dropped at the end of the previous chapter. And then, you know, Blake's like, okay, what the fuck are we going to do? They do it. And then at the end of the chapter, it's like, oh shit, now our situation's even worse. And, and it's, we do that every chapter. Very wisely, there's also not that many characters. So with the fast pacing, we get enough character time for the characters we do have. It's just, Ooh. it's win, win, win. Yeah, like our our core cast is very solid. I guess I, I, like three people right here. I, I, I'm I'm almost positive there probably isn't a packed tier list out there one day, but you know every character is in at least B tier. 
I don't know how I can break these characters. Oh my goodness. Anyways, uh, join us next time. We'll probably do all of Arc 6 whenever I get around to that, and maybe some of 7. Arc 6 is pretty long. It could be its own thing. And then... I think, six, I think 6 is the longest arc in Pact, if I was looking at the chapters, right? Yeah, it was 13 chapters, I think. If I'm not mistaken. It's, uh, it fucking goes. So, with that, I'll, well, I'll try to keep things a little bit shorter next time. Um, but also, we haven't talked about this in a while. And we and do dude, have a lot of uh, Wild Bow fans in general in our in our channel's subscriber account. So, it's in, like, uh, this one's for y'all. How could we ever shortchange Pact? Like... Never, never, ever. <laughs> never. And even Pale. We did, we'd give Pale the justice, despite yeah. my, my complaining. This is the this is the pact versus pale talk. Put it in the thumbnail. It's the ver now, it's the versus. Uh, and there's a, a clear of, winner. A lot of people. Yeah, well, I, I mean, you shouldn't throw yourself under the bus. I'll throw myself for you. I'll throw myself under the bus. Sure. Pact is Wild Bo's best book. Um, as far as like everyone <laughs> wanting us to do Ward, what do I got to say for, to them? Because it's been popping up again since we did our tier list for Worm and got a lot of uh the new fans because of that. For the ward yeah. gang out there, I, I'm we're definitely not touching it. I don't think until we finish packed or pale ends, um, and even then, I might do twig next. Like I, if I finish packed and pale, twig would probably be next on my list. Because the thing is, on the subreddit, every time I see like, oh, what's your favorite work come up. The the only people who don't say Twig is their favorite work are the people who haven't read, read Twig. Exactly. Like, if if you're telling me that you read Pact and Worm and you read Twig and you said it's better than both of them, you better be you better be telling the truth or I'm going to forsworn you, all right? I'm that's, saying. That's a high bar that you're setting there. But yeah. For Ward, at least, I think my policy is that uh, if either Willer or Tyler start it, you know, I'll hop in. I've, I've tried to start it before and I wasn't super vibing with it. And, you know... I think probably at this point the most common question on the subreddit is yeah. should I read Ward? And, yeah. uh, you know, it, it's very divisive. Some people will be like, hell yeah, it's fucking amazing. And then some people, like, I remember one take I saw is that someone said, you know, I was I was in Ward and I was really loving the buildup. And I was just reading the story and there was just this buildup, buildup, buildup. And I was waiting for the big nice. climactic gold morning finale to happen. And then the book ended. <laughs> so i don't know i'm scared i'm sure there's some minor climaxes in there yeah anywho goodbye everyone uh stay tuned for more content it'll probably take a little bit but it'll yeah happen. don't don't, don't wait up don't go anywhere but also don't <laughs> wait up. all right bye-bye bye-bye